Hello, friends. How are you? Thank you for joining us today for this is uh, episode eight of our uh, live lunch and learn here. I'm your man, Adam, with Worldwide Stereo. And today we're going to have a pretty awesome show. Um, we're circling back a little bit back and talking about TVs again, as there's a lot of new stuff that's starting to really uh, hit the ground running here with, with TV technology. So I got a really special friend with me today that's going to help me and help you understand everything that's out there as far as new TVs are concerned. So while we're waiting here, we're going to wait for some people to start to get logged in here so we can get a nice uh audience tell uh, tell us where you're from where you're where you're tuning in from let's see here so i got that up on the screen here again i'm going to cover things like the differences between 8k and 4k what's out there of course we're going to have the uh ever so qled oled conversation to basically competing uh technologies out there and what's good and, uh, about both of them what they can do for you um, a lot of new stuff out there, artificial intelligence and the importance of apps now that everybody's uh, at home and certainly streaming absolutely everything these days. So we're going to have that conversation too. So see everybody starting to come in, please. This is uh, interactive. We're all working from home here, but bring your questions. We want to have uh, a good conversation here. Again, I got an expert here with me that's going to really uh, help us dive in. So take advantage of this situation. So with that, I want to bring in my special guest from Samsung. His name is Scott Cohen. Let me uh, let me call him up here. Hang on one second. There he is. Hey, <laughs> what's going on, Scott? How are you? I am doing well. And yourself? Oh, excellent, excellent. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're really busy with a lot of stuff you do, so I really appreciate the time, wow. uh, my friends. This is Scott Cohen from Samsung. Scott Cohen from Samsung. Meet my friends. Hey everyone, happy to be here. A uh, little bit about myself. I work for Samsung, been here uh, going on 15 years, which is uh, also definitely how many years Samsung has been number one at TV, both globally and here in the US. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years working the retail floor um, and before moving on to the manufacturer. So ton of information on the TV industry. I've been around from when ProLogic was introduced, uh, when the first plasma TVs, when rear projection was very big. Um, in fact, when I first started at Samsung, when we would have a TV conversation, mm -hmm. it would be plasma, LCD, uh, tube TV, and DL DLP rear projection all vying for a spot in our living room. Wow. And uh, you know, now that it's so many years later, we can see LCD uh, you know, was the clear winner is plasma, rear projection, tube TVs are just not something we see anymore. And, I don't want to alienate the uh, front projector guys. The, the, that's a different projector market, and that's that's still going uh, very sure. strong. Um, so yeah, here at Samsung, I, I run the training division, and over 15 years with Samsung, you know, a lot has changed in TVs. We saw a lot of uh, firsts with Samsung. We saw the introduction mm -hmm. of uh, 1080p, which was HD, uh, which was a very big change for for everybody to go from four by three square TVs to rectangle TVs. Yeah. Um, I was around for you know the 4K switch and and now the the transition to 8K. So you right. know the 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 comment of history re repeats itself. It sure does. This is now the third time uh, while I've been with Samsung that we are we're moving on to a new resolution and people are questioning why do we need the new resolution and uh, you know the content versus uh, screen wars. So you know it's been a it's been a long run with Samsung for me for sure, but. Uh, All right, looks like Scott uh, might have a little issue right here. Uh, we'll see if we can hopefully get him back soon. Yeah. Uh, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> little blip on the radar there. Oh. Okay, hang on one second, everybody. So I know we're going to talk about uh, what he's trying to mention. I mean, the, all the new stuff that's coming out, the AK technology, and is there content for that kind of uh, kind of stuff that's out there? And we want to have that conversation and not only just talk about what you know, Samsung has to offer, but certainly where the industry is right now. Scott's a guy that he's constantly, I've seen him on CDA videos on the CES shows that are out there on the big electronic shows um, talking about, I mean, robots of all things I've seen him talking about at CES. So Samsung has a lot to offer um, and a lot of, they bring a lot of knowledge. There's some cool things out there that they, uh, they absolutely do. Uh, that you may not know about. I mean, they're one of the largest chip manufacturers in the world. I mean, when they need a a chip, they need they need to you know 
make it themselves. Like they used to buy them um, for their TVs, but not too long ago, they started actually manufacturing their own. So there's tons of stuff that they do um, besides what people mostly know them for, which would be TVs, um, appliances, uh, of course, the Samsung phones. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff that they do um, on their own. Uh, I think one time Scott told me they even get into making yachts. And I think we have Scott back here. Let me see if I can get him back up there. Hey, hey. I'm back. Hey. Not, not sure what the glitch was uh, or how much you heard, but I'm here <laughs> now. I was just trying to explain to my friends here about uh, uh, what Samsung does that they may not know about. You know, I mentioned that I think one time you told me that they make yachts or they got into yeah. that. So, I mean, yeah. what, what other things do they do? Uh, so, yeah, Samsung is a very big company, and most people here in the U.S. know us from the electronics portion of the business, which is cell phones, appliances, TVs, computers, tablets, um, smart things, devices, et cetera, mm -hmm. and so forth. But Samsung does also build the tallest buildings in the world. It's, it's done by a Samsung construction company, heavy machinery. That's crazy. Um, so we are making the tallest buildings. We are making also the largest oil tankers. We build cruise liners with our shipbuilders. Uh, we have banks and hospitals in Korea, as well as our, our uh, own credit card. So Samsung's really has their hands in yeah. everything. Um, you know, and even when it comes to our industry, um, a lot of people are looking at Samsung Electronics, but another closely related business for that is this Samsung Visual Display, which is the actual factory that oh. builds TVs that the Samsung Electronics brand sells. Um, so lots of different companies, lots of different factories making lots of different things for Samsung. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the more notable acquisitions for Samsung was Harman International a few years back, yeah. uh, where we bought the entire Harman uh, portfolio, very high end audio companies were, were part of that portfolio, as well as a lot of car audio, um, uh, uh, car audio technology and patents that we were able to acquire as well, mm -hmm. which really got us into, you know, uh, the, you know, future tech of automotive. Very cool. I mean, guys out there, if you don't know Harman International, they're a massive, massive audio company. And they bring us some of the luxury brands out there like Mark Levinson. Um, they also do JBL, more maybe more of a common name for, for, for everybody to know. I mean, this is a huge audio company. So for Samsung to uh, acquire them, it's just an amazing thing. So that brings all of that, uh, I guess, business structure to Harman International that Samsung has. As you can see, they have their hands in, I mean, building building skyscrapers and stuff like that's, that's insane yeah. that's insane you never would have thought about that about your you know your refrigerator or your washer and dryer to, mm -hmm. to be in that so very very cool so that is eye-opening i hope everybody you know that opens their eyes just like it did mine when i heard all of those things it's about you know, what, what Samsung re does. related to to the you know the Harmon um acquisition is is we have an audio lab out in california and even though samsung is a south korean company we do have a lot of uh industry and factory and stuff going on here in America, such as our semiconductor plant in Austin. But the lab in California is it's an amazing place. It's one of my favorite Samsung places or labs to go to. Uh, they have two anechoic chambers. And, uh, you know, why do you need two anechoic chambers? Well, we have one that tests speakers. So it could be a standalone speaker and you could do a full 360 test as the microphone can actually move 180 degrees around the speaker. So for anyone who knows uh, sound testing, yeah. Okay. Uh, how to test sound and how to test speakers, complete isolation, we have it. But what that chamber didn't do for us is help us with our sound bars and speakers in the TV. For that, we needed an anechoic chamber that really was meant for something to be mounted on the wall. So we have a separate anechoic chamber specifically to test out sound bars and TV speakers. And that's one of the things that Samsung has really stepped up in over the last few years leading to this one, which yeah. is the speakers in the TVs. But when I started at Samsung, big speakers on the sides of the TVs were bragging rights. It was, <laughs> it was like, yeah, you know, my speakers need to be as big as the TV, but not anymore. Design is such a, a, a bigger focus on your TV purchase. Speakers got smaller and smaller, yeah. and we had to work with less and less. And that lab in California is what's responsible for putting these awesome little speakers in the TVs, uh, like the frame behind me, yet allowing us to keep the design we're looking to give to the customer. You mean that's not a piece of artwork back there? <laughs> no, that behind me is the 65-inch uh, frame, which is a lifestyle television from Samsung. Yeah. It's been super successful. Um, in fact, a, a TV line that started with just two models um, is now expanded. The frame TV is available in 32, 43, uh, all the way up to 75 inch this year. Yeah. Um, 
And it's become a big seller because as TVs get bigger, uh, people don't want a large black rectangle in the room. And the frame is a 4K QLED TV. Mm -hmm. But when you're not using it, it goes into this art mode. We have an art store with thousands of pieces of works of art, or you can upload your own art. You mm -hmm. can have selected some matting to go with the, the color decor of my room. I can have the pictures rotate. And when I'm not in the room, the TV goes off. So I'm not wasting any energy. But when anyone's using this room, it looks like a picture. Yeah, it does. And I see you did the, there's a custom frames that you can get there. It looks like you have the white one surrounded by yours. I think it comes, you know, natively black, but you can get. Correct. Yeah, frame like that. I'm going to get up for a second here. These are, are magnetic. Um, so these come right off and on. We offer four colors. So you can really get this to match with the decor of the room. Well, that was uh, and then with the Madden colors. So really lots of different options to get this to customize to fit to your room. Frames are sold separately in the four colors, and then you buy the TV separate. Other really cool things comes with a, what's called a no-gap wall mount. Right. Now, this mount allows the TV to go flush to the wall. So just like all the other pictures in your house, there's no gap of wires. It's, it's all right there, flat against the wall. Um, so it comes with the mounting solution, everything you need except... You just need to choose the bezel. Uh, so yeah. it's a great product for, for Samsung. And, and really, you know, as I said, I've been with Samsung for many years and there's been many, very many trends of what the in thing to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, with technology. And what Samsung found is as TVs got bigger and we know they're getting bigger and bigger, yeah. um, hiding the TV in plain sight has become a much more important thing. Uh -huh. The frame solved for two problems. One, it allowed people to go bigger in a room that may be the TV room, but also the family room you entertain in where you don't want TV to be the centerpiece. So it allows you to put a bigger TV in that room and also rooms you wouldn't have put a TV in to, to room the decor like bedrooms and studies and libraries and things like that really opened up the possibilities. So the frame allows you to put it in more places and go yeah. bigger and hide it in your favorite place. For sure. And I mean, I like the, with the custom bezels there, you can kind of change maybe per year or decorating that you have going on. Mm -hmm. Also the no gap wall mount is absolutely fantastic. And certainly you really need to use it for that frame TV because a piece of art doesn't stick off the wall like a TV. But behind me, I have a different kind of TV here. And there's so many different kinds of mounts that are out there from, uh, uh, we have these awesome like corner TV mounts from a company called Canto and Sanus makes these great brackets uh, that I can articulate and pull away from the wall. So there's a lot of different styles of brackets, friends out there that you can really uh, get to make your TV kind of custom for your specific situation. But certainly with the frame, you need that no gap one because of, a, you know, you want to play to the wall. And I, I do want to point out, although our mount will tilt down 15 degrees, if you, you mount it up high, oh, yeah. the standard VESA pattern back there, because a lot of the mounts you just described is not with what comes in the box. If you need articulating or a corner mount, uh, the frame will still work for you, but you would need to purchase one of those mounts that you just mentioned. Yep, yep. And for also uh, like a TV that gets mounted above a fireplace like you, we also have a company called Mantle Mount that can help you get that TV down. You know, it comes off the wall right. and then goes down. So that way it's more at a, at a, at a usable um, eye level for when you're watching. So that's very cool. So I'd like to dive in here and talk about some of the new, I mean, 2020. You know, the show, we had all the new TVs and all the new styles, and 8K really seemed to be the a heavy hitter this year as far as, you know, TVs that were out there. But there's a lot of people that may not even have a 4K TV yet, so I want to spend a little bit of time and get your um, opinion because the question I get a lot from my friends is, well, one, is there 4K? Ah, 4K, um, I don't need a 4K TV. There's not 4K content. But now people see these 8K TVs out there. So is there 8K content? Why, why do we need an 8K TV, and, and, and what's going on with that? You know, there, there's two ways to tackle the question. Um, first, why now, right? Why 8K, why now? Why didn't we do it last year? Why aren't we doing it in two years? Why now? And, you know, we got the same questions when we switched to 4K and sure. similar questions when we switched to HD, which is to 1080p. And what's going on is the resolution that the TV manufacturer manufacturers are offering is heavily related onto the screen sizes that the customers are asking for. When we switched to HD 46, 55, or 50, because it was really plasma at that time, mm -hmm. were big sizes. And the old TV signal that we were using for tube just didn't give us the clarity um, or bring the screen's full potential. So we went to 1080p to make that picture clear. When screen size jumped up to 65 and 70, we needed to go to 4K because what's going on is the TV behind me is made up of little squares. And as you bring up the TV screen size, the squares get bigger, picture loses detail. 
Mm -hmm. It's about something called pixels per inch. Right. The average screen height, now, uh, screen uh, size is moving way up um, these days, where a 75 inch is one of the most popular TV sizes. So if you want to maintain that same clarity that you had with your 55 on your 75, then you need to get a higher resolution. Now, there is the argument, well, can my eye perceive it? Well, sure. there is a there is some science behind how close you're sitting before it's perceivable. But yeah. here's the interesting fact. Most people that had that 36 inch tube TV who haven't moved yet, replaced it at some point with a 55 and are now looking at a 75. What they forgot to do is the con construction work to move their couch back and make their room bigger. So they're <laughs> sitting the same six to eight feet away from larger and larger screens. So moving the resolution up is an important way to keep clarity at okay. these bigger screen sizes. In addition, um, we're looking at the uh, the 8KY now is the ecosystem. We're mm. starting to see 8K cameras that can capture all of this resolution. We're starting to see them on phones. We're starting to see them uh, being used in the movie studios. Um, the next Olympics, when it happens, uh, will be recorded in 8K and probably made available as an 8K. Video game consoles uh, from the leading leading manufacturers, Sony and, and Microsoft, so their next gaming console will be 8K. As a gamer, every bit of resolution I can get from the game to my screen is every bit of an advantage of seeing that detail, spotting that person in a, in a first person shooter game. Hmm. The more detail you have, the better it is. And that's going to go from gaming to movies. And then finally, the movies, the content we all want. Yeah. I remember when someone said, we're never going to get streaming to the point where you can get HD at the home. And then someone said, you're never going to get streaming <laughs> to the point where you can get 4K. And now they're saying it again. And yeah. each time they give us some weird number and acronym, which is the solution. It used to be H.264, H.265, which are compression codecs that take a video signal and shrink it down and send it over the pipeline. The current codec that everyone is uh, talking about is AV1. Super mm -hmm. excited that Samsung uh, uh, TVs will have AV1 in it. We're super excited to hear that YouTube is supporting the AV1 codec. So customers that have 8K TVs today can watch YouTube movies in 8K that were recorded in 8K so they can capture all of that realism. That's got to be awesome. Yeah. I mean, and, you, you know, is eight, is someone's, you know, we get a lot of people that like to ask, kind of push the envelope. Well, is 8K enough? Or once I invest in this 8K TV in five years, we'll go to 10K or 12K. And the answer is maybe. Uh, maybe we will. Uh, look, the ultimate goal is to make TV look like real life. And generally speaking, if you put a window and a TV showing an image of the scene in the window, someone's going to know which is the real life and which is the TV each time. And those limitations in resolution, color, contrast that the real world produces. And if our goal is to eventually get there, then getting up to 8K right now is going to be the closest point to reality we can get. Have they ever done that, like that, a test like that, like actually put a TV in a window and tried to frame it up so it looked like a window and then have a real window next to it and then like maybe shoot the outdoor scene onto the TV? Have, have they ever done that? I, I've never personally been involved in, in something like that, but I've been in places where they do use TV screens as fake windows, huh. uh, which is definitely something we can uh, talk about a little later with the future of TV. Or from the movie Back to the Future, and they went to the future, and they had that screen wall that they kept. Yeah. Down. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it sounds like we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, a neat little question came up here, and I'm going to pop it up here from Jersey John. How are we to deal with, you know, nine thousand dollar AK TV, but no receivers that handle over over 4K? And I think that has something to do with more of like the uh, the HDMI specification that we're seeing, because I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you deal with it a lot. The HDMI specification of 2.1. Isn't that good enough to handle uh, 8K? So that's a great question. And Jersey John, uh, I'm from Jersey myself now, so a great question. Um, so this does have to do with the ability to pass HDM, uh, pass the signal via HDMI from one component on to the next. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the cool things about 8K is the new HDMI 2.1 spec. The thing with the HDMI 2.1 spec is it's become very confusing as the full spec is a list of features. Uh, the feature, the coveted feature, is the ability to pass uh, 8K at 60 frames, 4K at 120 frames. Okay. Um, and that requires bandwidth. 
Some of the other cool features, such as eARC, um, right. which is enhanced ARC, which will carry Dolby um, Atmos and the higher bandwidth um, sound, uh, uh, surround sound codecs, mm -hmm. um, does exist and is in the TV. So if you are dealing with a receiver like you may have, what you could do is, you know, run your sources directly into the HDMI ports on the TV and then have the TV's eARC feed your receiver. Mm -hmm. I know this would probably change your wiring diagram through everything going through the receiver and probably cause into a little bit of a uh, dilemma on how to now reprogram your, your custom remote. So I do aware there are some pain points there, but mm -hmm. just as the TV manufacturers, not just Samsung, are including these HDMI 2.1 ports, uh, the receiver companies will follow suit. Um, and, and you know, some for some people, it's it's a it's a sad story when you have to get get rid of your receiver and move on, and for others, they're super excited to get the newest, latest, and greatest, and a reason to a reason to go about doing it. Um, but while we're on the two point one spec, it sure. really is important that you realize not every TV needs every feature. For example, the creme de la creme of the two point one spec is the expanded bandwidth, which would carry eight K at sixty frames. If you're looking at a four K TV today. You don't need that feature. You don't need to bring 8K to the to the TV. So at that point, that feature of HDMI 2.1 may not be important to you. eARC is very important. Yes, and the it reason is. it's important is that there are so many smart TV apps offering Dolby Atmos, like Voodoo um, and Amazon Prime and various other streaming apps that that's going directly to the TV, and you're going to need a way to feed that to the receiver. So eARC is supported on all Samsung models, and most companies are now including it on their high-end stuff. And uh, so that's an important one. Auto low latency, which for Samsung is known as game mode. It picks up when a video game system is, is um, on, automatically switches to the lowest lag time mode for the TV, which is called game mode. Uh, so that's a feature of 2.1 and super important for you video gamers or mm -hmm. super important if your kids are playing video games and you want the TV not to be in game mode when you sit down to watch a movie. Um, <laughs> Again, for the gamers, variable refresh rate is, uh, is another big one for us, which yes. is the ability to match the Xbox frame rate so we can less tearing uh, and better detail. So lots of cool things going on uh, mm -hmm. there. But those are the key 2.1 specs most people are talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the you know, the, the eARC has been is, is is paramount in a lot of our setups and, and being yeah. able to get. And, when, and that's just to keep things, I think, simpler out there. I mean, the TVs have virtually every single app you could ever – need or want built inside of them so to be able to harness and leverage and get out that great audio signal for into a uh you know from dolby atmos into a sound system or a sound bar that supports atmos is is great um and the control of it too like whatever remote folks you're you're using typically if you're using a samsung remote control it's going to control that external device with basically no programming you just have to check a couple boxes in the menu system and now your samsung remote is controlling your yamaha receiver or your sennheiser uh soundbar or or whatever so it's 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 great for that as well so really neat uh technology um the other thing i want to kind of touch on is voice assistant and that's mm. uh a big category uh certainly it's it's exponentially growing year after year you know the googles and the, and the series and the and the uh uh, Amazons and you even have your own built into yours. So is, is there a preferred uh, voice assistant for your t for your TVs or all TVs out there? What is Samsung doing? So, uh, you know, interestingly, Samsung does have our own digital assistant, Bixby. Um, Bixby does a great job with the TV. Uh, and essentially, Bixby can, Bixby can control any feature in the TV. Anything that's in the menu that can be turned on or off can be done by Bixby. Uh, but we are aware that when, when it comes to digital assistants that people do make choices. So what Samsung did is we work with the two largest digital home digital assistants, which is Alexa and, and the Google Home platform. Mm -hmm. And for 2020, Samsung TVs will work with any of those three. You can oh. use Bixby, you can use Alexa, and you can use Google. And what we wanted to do is we know a lot of home setup is going on right now. Deliveries and installs have been cut down. Customers are buying TVs and installing. Mm -hmm. To simplify the process during the setup, uh, stage of your TV, you'll actually choose it at that point. So you don't even have to go back in at a later date. So when you're setting the TV up for the initial setup, which by the way, Samsung is made super simple. If, if you haven't got the new Samsung TV, this is, this is what's going on now. When you get it home, you power it up for the first time, it's going to look for your phone running the SmartThings app. It could be an mm -hmm. Android, it could be an Apple, 
-hmm. When it finds your phone, you do the rest of the setup through the phone, which includes sharing your home network and password, a network yeah. name and password. You don't have to find your router. You don't have to go enter all the numbers and digits one at a time. It does it all automatically through your phone. We'll also set up some of the AI features, your digital assistant, and get you started, um, which has really been a big pain point for, for a lot of customers, which is that install process, which is very uh, difficult as it's not as simple as just plugging an antenna in anymore. And Samsung walks you through it. Um, <laughs> Although I have, an, I have an antenna, so I did do that, and I get about 70 channels over the air, which looks great. Antennas are still a great way to, to get yeah. uncompressed, uh, you know, uh, content. And you know, ATSC 3.0 is coming out now, so uh, you know, antennas could become a, a big thing again. Mm -hmm. So I will say, well, so we got a, a little a, a comment that came up here. Uh, he's mentioning more specifically Siri. Uh, how can you not support Apple? I mean, you do support Apple in the regards of, uh, and most you know, TV manufacturers are starting to go this way too with the uh, AirPlay ability. And also you have the built-in uh, Apple TV built into some of these newer TVs as well. Um, but to, to Rob's point, any any uh, any future thing that you know of maybe about doing anything with Siri? So no mention on what uh, on anything to do with Siri. And 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 Siri, you know, Siri and Apple make a great product. But when Samsung was looking, we were looking at the largest home uh, assistants to bring on first. And I don't think there's much debate that when it comes to within the home. Alexa and Google seem to be the largest uh, players there. So sure. we're supporting them. However, you know, Samsung and Apple, you know, we, we work great together. We realize a lot of our Samsung TV customers have Apple product. So we do support AirPlay too, uh, we, which brings a whole host of uh, features uh, such as screen sharing and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, a a computer sharing up to, the, up to the TV, which has become very uh, important at this stay at home juncture because a lot of kids are doing uh, schoolwork on tablets and and uh, you know uh, Apple products, and if they want to share that up to the 65 inch to make it easier to work, uh, it's something we can do. And Samsung okay. was the first uh, TV manufacturer to bring Apple TV on board, and had had it for at least six months, I think, before any competitor had it. Um, so we do work with Apple uh, often. Siri is not currently one of them, but you know the advantage to Apple TV. Uh, being built in, and, and this is what I wanted to touch upon a little earlier with the apps. It's a question I do get is, should I use the apps in the TV, or should I use a Fire Stick or or some third party device? That's a great and, question. Yeah, and that's a great question, and you know ties in. Do I need a separate Apple TV? And here's the, uh, the 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 gist of it is, your best bet is to use the apps that are built into the TV, whatever brand TV you're using, because. Mm -hmm. When these TVs hit the app site, whether it be Netflix or Voodoo or whom you use, um, there is a little handshake that goes on, which lets the app service and the TV uh, let each other know what their capabilities are so that you get the highest resolution, best HDR format mm -hmm. available for your TV um, versus using a standalone box where sometimes the HDMI connection will either lower or change those settings so you're not really getting the best of the best. Where I do believe it may make sense to use a third party uh, device is maybe you have a TV that's five or six years old and you know, smart platforms, just like the smart platform on our phone where we replace it very often, um, the apps become more taxing and taxing and need more hardware and more, uh, and more um, RAM and memory to work. So if you find that you have a TV that's five or six years old or you know, one of the first smart TVs and it's very sluggish, for you I may recommend getting one of these third party yeah. devices keeping in mind a TV that old probably not has the highest resolution and probably doesn't support HDR at this time. Right. And that is AirPlay. I mean, it's AirPlay 2, right? Yeah. It's the second, the second version. So yeah, Paul came in and just asked AirPlay 2.0. And so, yes, that is, that is correct. It that's is, correct. it is AirPlay 2 in those. So that's awesome. And I mean, I, this is for folks, if you don't know, this is a Samsung TV behind me. It's a 75 Q 90 that I have. So uh, last year's, uh, you know, QLED series top of the line that they have. And there's uh, it's been great. You know, I have to have the AirPlay built in and I use it. I use that uh, feature set often. So it's really cool to have. Uh, oh, let's get into. So we talked about the frame TV and you can show uh, pictures there. Um, but the other kind of mode that's built into this TV behind me is what's called ambient mode. 
And that's a little bit different than the frame in terms of showing artwork. Uh, ambient mode is a little bit more geared towards, I think, like uh, I always say, you know, paintings, actual paintings is what the frame does. But like a photographer's art studio is kind of what the ambient mode has in. And it also has some other cool things. And I want to show you folks uh, with the Smart Things app and how you can really control that. So I do have um, I do have the Smart Things app open here on, on my phone. It is an iPhone. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we were Sorry, Scott. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I'll bring up the Smart Things app and I'll bring up this TV. And there's an option on here for ambient mode. And when I hit that, I just hit the one that I want. And I hit View on TV, and it's going to load right on there. And there's my ambient mode on the back, which is I have the light grid on there right now. Very popular one. Yeah, and there's different styles and things that you can do here. I can put it into this what's called party party one mode, which is kind of neat. There you go real flashy, some things that you can do. And, or you could just throw up, uh, like I said, I'll show you more of the pictures that they have. Let me go back here and I'll select, I'll go to um, artwork. And here we go. This is called Summer Fun. There you go. So yeah. it's a different way of utilizing your TV. Uh, like the frame, you know, when it's off, you can leave this on and just have something in, on the back of your TV all the time as opposed to just a black screen. Yeah, no one likes black screens. And uh, I'm not going to, I mean, it's Googleable, but one of the countries, uh, Samsung, where real, ran a very interesting ad campaign on ambient mode. And what they did was in the middle of like a big soccer game when it cut to the commercial, uh, yeah. They use their commercial time to show a black screen for about 10 seconds uh, during a major soccer or football uh, match. <laughs> and like you can imagine, you're hosting friends and your screen goes black for 10 seconds. You've got that big. And they came back and said, no one likes to see a blank screen on the wall. And, and the truth is, is that's what we were trying to get rid of. You know, when TVs were smaller, we, we, it, they were easy to blend and hide. But 65-inch, mm -hmm. 75-inch a black screen is just a big black void. Now the frame behind me does show artwork. You could do matting. However, ambient mode, there's lots of cool things you can do. For one, if you do have a brick wall behind the TV, once oh, you yeah. have the TV on the wall, you can take a picture of the TV on the wall around it. The TV will continue the brick pattern and it kind of gives the TV a very transparent look. And then you can put overlays over the transparent look, such as the light rods he was showing earlier, uh, clocks and various other things. There's even a mode where you could put a cool design up on the TV and then using the smart things app, maybe take a picture of your curtains or one of the colors of the walls that's very prevalent in the room. And we'll drag those colors from your curtains over to the TV to get mm -hmm. it to blend. But we learned that lifestyle is, is such a big uh, purchasing decision. In fact, um, Samsung took the number one lead in 2006 with TVs. And it's interesting, the TV that we launched that took number one spot, um, which was called the Bordeaux or the 4051 for the Google people out there that want to check check it. First, people didn't want to see the... So we got to get Scott. Uh, I think we're going to mail him one of our worldwide stereo networks that we talked about the other day. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Am I still here? I kind of blacked out. You got it. Time. You got it. Yep. Yeah, there you go. So, there you go. You know, people didn't want to see speakers and it let us know that the design and look of the TV is important. So uh, ambient mode, which is on all Q series TVs, there's a mm -hmm. ambient light on the Q60, uh, but on the Q70 above, they have a full ambient mode. You can take picture wall, make TV transparent, put plenty of different designs, moving patterns, still patterns, clocks. But ways to really use the TV to dress up the room. Um, the new 2020 frame actually has a version of ambient mode. So if you don't want to do the art thing, you could do the ambient thing. And Very the latest cool. thing that we added to ambient is music wall. Uh, for Samsung, music wall allows you to Bluetooth your mobile device to your TV. Use your TV sound system. And we'll show some really cool visuals up on the screen while uh, you listen to music. That's really cool. Kind of like a, a way newer and definitely cooler version of old school iTunes when you used yeah, to have exactly. that, that visualizer up on the screen when, yeah. you, when you listen to music. So that was always cool. Um, awesome. So, so right now we just kind of talked, we did a little bit of overview of 2020 TVs kind of technology. We talked specifically to uh, HDMI 2.1, which is kind of a big thing right now. Everybody's talking about trying to understand and wrap their head around what that brings to the table uh, with 8K and 4K. Uh, 4k technology if anybody is just tuning in now remember that you can always go back and watch these as they'll be posted on facebook and youtube to reference any of those topics that we brought up um 
So moving forward, all right, you got your uh, you got your gloves on. You're gonna put your gloves on here. We're gonna get ready to go. We're gonna talk about OLED versus QLED or QLED, and those two com uh, we'll say competing technologies, but they're really out there. And I think there's reasons to do one or the other. Um, you know, OLED technology, certainly they talk a lot about the big thing out there is the black. It's black, 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 getting, you know, the infinite black that they have. And they, they do have that for sure. Uh, but not to shortchange the the QLEDs or the QLEDs, they certainly get there as well. And there's, I think, benefits to both of them. So what I'd like, Scott, is if you could overview this and, and talk about the pros and cons, I think, uh, from your perspective, because you really get, I remember you telling me you go to the, uh, you know, you work with the, the engineers and things and you go to test labs and you've really, yeah. you know, seen these things in, in all their glory and what they can do. So you have a pretty cool perspective. I know you, again, you work for Samsung. So at the end of the day, you know, Samsung, but you know, I know you've seen both of these. So what can you, what can you tell me about QLED versus OLED? Yeah. So it's, it's a great topic of conversation and one, when we, we definitely talk about often, um, you know, you always tell me to share little facts with the group. Uh, for those yes. that, that may know or may not know, Samsung launched an OLED TV back in 2013. Uh, yeah. it, was based, it was based on RGB OLED, so red, mm -hmm. green, and, and blue OLED, um, instead of the white OLED, which has become the prevalent OLED format. Uh, today, Samsung chose not to continue down that road, and then we did go to QLED, so we, we will get to that, uh, why we did it, the pros, the cons. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, as far as OLED is concerned as a technology, Samsung by far is still the largest producer of OLED in the world. Mm -hmm. um, they are on all of our smartphones and uh, various other portable devices. They're on our tablets, they're on our computers, they're on our computer monitors. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, you know, you're finding, you know, finding uh, QLED and OLED everywhere. Um, but for TV, Samsung did choose to go the QLED route. Uh, the reason is we, you know, we looked at the two technologies and the advantages and disadvantages of, of both. And when we take a step back in time, we looked at plasma and we looked at LCD. Okay. And we, we ended up with two baskets of customers. You had the purists, the video enthusiasts, the video files, the audio files, the, you know, the home electronics gear heads, we all liked plasma. We all loved plasma. Sure. Um, but the main public liked LCD. And, you know, when we're going back and forth, we, we were trying to figure out why, and a lot of customers were afraid of image retention on plasma. But the one thing that we learned with LCD, and Samsung learned it very unbiasedly. We used our Samsung F8500, in my opinion, one of the best plasma TVs that ever out there. I own and one. we put it on the sales floor, 65 inch versus the 65 inch equivalent Samsung LED. Put them side by side, put them at the same price, LED one every time. So it really told us that brightness, color saturation, um, being able to work in many different environments, very bright rooms and very dim rooms, because what we did here with our plasma days is, eh, during the day, the plasma, is, it's okay, but it really pops at night. And LCD was the technology, uh, or LED at the time, was the technology that really brought that pop. So Samsung, rather than deal with um, the technology uh, similarities with plasma, which is it doesn't go as bright, has image retention. We stuck with LED and made it even better. Uh, when it comes to OLED as a TV, uh, you know, technology, it does bring self-illuminating pixels, which really does give it that infinite black and really does give it a, a significant advantage in that dark home theater room where you have controlled lighting. Mm -hmm. The downside to getting that black is the, you know, best performing OLEDs out today reach around 900 to 1,000 nits uh, during HDR spectral highlights where you're seeing the best in LCD and LED technologies from many manufacturers getting much closer to three and 4,000 nits. Um, and when you don't have controlled room lighting, meaning you're not watching everything in your theater, um, how bright you can make the spectral highlight to compete with the ambient lighting in the room is what we really saw as, as a huge benefit. Yep. So, uh, you know, whereas, you know, OLED does bring the punchy and, and, and infinite blacks, I feel like QLED makes a more versatile TV. And then, you know, from a brand and looking at what customers are interested in, and one of the big things on customers' minds is durability. With a QLED technology, Samsung can offer the Q guarantee, which is a lifetime guarantee against mm -hmm. image retention. Mm -hmm. So that our customers making that decision 
can feel comfortable to know that image retention isn't something they're going to get. Now, I'm not saying image retention is a huge problem on OLED. They've made many strides to to improve upon that. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, I've made the mistake of leaving video games paused for too long. I'm a big, big video gamer. Um, so, you know, accidents do happen. And knowing that there's a guarantee with Samsung makes a lot of customers safe and, and makes it the right choice. Um, does Samsung still make OLED? We make tons of OLED for the portable devices. We're not abandoning that technology. There is definitely, um, you know, some solid, you know, uh, benefits to the technology. But in the TV world, you know, quantum dots where we can produce 100% color volume, get colors accurate, mm -hmm. is what we chase down. Yeah, I mean, so this is, uh, I've talked about it before. I, I built this family room last year. It's an addition off the back of my house, and there's a lot of light. So that was certainly a consideration that I made in choosing a TV for this particular room. Um, and as you can see now, I, you know, if you guys watch my live streams a lot, I always have this on. <laughs> so to speak about image retention, I'm not, I'm not worried at all about having this worldwide stereo logo up on the back of my TV behind me. Um, mm -hmm. And again, but OLEDs have done a lot. I mean, I have, I have an OLED out in my other room. I have from, from about three, three years ago, I think that I got an OLED and it's been, and it's been great. Uh, but in, in, I knew I had more light here that I had to deal with in this room. So that's why I did this. So they're both great TVs. Um, you know what? I, what I want to touch upon, though, is mm -hmm. that over the years that Samsung has not done the OLED, which you know is around 2014, right? Um, the the Achilles heel of the QLED or LED based technology is the backlight leakage, mm -hmm. and that's where the LCD panel itself and the backlighting uh, engines that drive them have made significant improvements of reducing and removing the backlight uh, yeah. haloing and backlight leakage, which really brings our top of the line QLEDs uh, with the most amount of dimming zones and Samsung's proprietary anti-blooming technology uh, yeah. really on par, if not right there with the best of OLEDs. Yeah, and if you guys can see, when you look down here, the established 1979 and the and the white line right there, you know, it's, it, there's, there's, there's zero blooming around those. So you're seeing just that white against that black background right there. Um, and that's what that's where they've been working on and what he's talking about, being able to control those LEDs. So it's really, really good. Or even up around like the worldwide in, in the in the yellow right there. You know, you don't see this massive bloom of color around it. It's it's razor sharp against the black background. And that's somewhere something that uh, you're always trying to improve on in this LED based technology. Yeah. Good. Why? Well, I, I didn't see anybody have any questions that they want to ask about OLEDs and QLEDs versus that. You know, please, uh, please let us know. You have again, you have a great resource here, and Scott, who's seen a lot of TVs and a lot of testing on all these TVs, to, to be able to answer these for you. Um, last, I want to get into uh, what we call, you know, lifestyle TVs, and we talked about it already. And you have the frame TV right there, and what that brings to the table in terms of showing artwork and being part of the lifestyle. Uh, I showed you the ambient mode available on my Q90 Samsung right here, and showing artwork and the light color bars and, and having fun with the TV. Uh, but there's something else out there that I think we really want to hit on, and it's called micro LED. And uh, talking about that, and even even theater screens that are made from these big micro LED technologies. And I wanna share something here, Scott. I have that that video that kind of goes over this, uh, what we call like the wall TV that you guys have. Um, and I want you to, if you can, explain a little bit of it as it's kind of going to show us what we're, what we're looking at. So let me add this here. And let me hit play on this here. Oh, where is it? There, there we go. So this is the, the video that you have on your website about the wall TV, right? Yeah, so the wall TV is a, is a great new product from Samsung. And you know, when we're having the OLED and QLED conversation, the direction usually goes, well, what's next? And this is it. Uh, this technology is called micro LED. Uh, Samsung offers it in a many different sizes, 146 inch 4K, we could do a 292 inch 8K. Uh, we've shown 150 inch 8K, um, but this is the creme de la creme. And for those that are thinking, whoa, Samsung makes 146 inch TV. Do you have a 146 inch doorway to bring it through? <laughs> if not, don't worry. This TV actually comes in little pieces and we put it together. So a few things here. First, this is the newest TV uh, technology to hit the home in, since OLED. And so since 2012, 2013. 
What this does is each pixel is a small red, a small blue, and a small green LED. So it's three little light bulbs in there. Red, green, and blue allow us to create any color in the rainbow. RGB is definitely the preferred way to, to make color. Uh, but when you want it off, you can turn it off. So we can create that e infinite, infinite black, yet it's LED based. So we could do LED brightness, which is gonna give us the brightest colors and whites with the darkest black. So okay. uh, no off angle viewing, no image retention, so no light leakage. So any problem that you would complain about, say a QLED or an OLED, or if you were still watching your plasma or even your tube or rear projection, um, these or front projection, these are all solved with micro LED. Um, hmm. So we talked about each pixel makeup, and now we understand why it's, it's gonna give us the best of both worlds. Uh, the modular design is what's going to be awesome. Um, it's gonna allow you to build a TV in numerous sizes, build video walls. And what's really cool really is awesome. this technology is really based off of the same technology of the signs that are in Vegas or in Times Square, uh, those huge, huge video boards. Yeah. We've basically shrunken technology down, the pixels down, mm -hmm. so that they're so small, we can get high resolution for the home. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, you know, this we believe is gonna be the future. Uh, we're gonna see both the technology of micro LEDs start to roll down um, in size, and then we're gonna start to see the modular TVs being used for multiple purposes. Yeah. Now, what exactly is a modular TV? Well, imagine when you wanted to build your TV, the TVs came in eight by 11s or 12 by 12 squares, and you put them together and built your TV. This will change where and how you use video screens. You know, and the example I like to use is, Maybe you have a bar in your basement, in your, in your entertainment room, and you always wanted like, like you have an eight foot bar and you want like an eight foot wide screen, two feet high. You just want sharks swimming back and forth. It's the technology that can bring that to you. Um, you know, if you don't have, you know, enough windows in your apartment, you know, you can hang a square tile up, dress it up with windows and show footage of outdoors and really give it that window feel. So what we're going to start to see is TVs moving away from specifically focused on uh, watching blockbuster movies and sitcom TV to adding decor to your home lifestyle. Um, so you may have a, you know, a video wall up, uh, you know, one of these big 146 inch and what you're showing is a fake marble slab with pictures hung on your fake marble slab. When you want to watch TV, you watch it on a 65 inch um, in the middle. So you can really control what size picture you have. Um, so micro LED will become big. It's, it's uh, been shown at CES for the last few years. Um, so we really expect to, to see this uh, industry or this technology to grow uh, from just being used outside in signage and billboard to the inside the home. Now, Samsung is currently selling the 146 up to 292 inch. So this isn't a future product. This is something we sell today. Wow. And didn't you see this in a theater and you told me you played a game on a, on a what, a 600 some odd? It's yeah, true. yeah. So um, the technology, which is micro LED, is based on two things. One is each pixel is its three little light bulbs, the red, green, and blue. Uh -huh. uh, and then the pixels need to be so close together. Um, so just outside of the micro uh, realm, as far as how close the pixels are matched, we do supply this technology. It's called the Onyx screen from Samsung. Feel free to Google it. Find out if you have a movie theater uh, with an Onyx screen in your area. And the Onyx screen is a Samsung LED wall instead of using a projector. Wow. This is an amazing use of the technology. Um, for one, the HDR range on an LED panel is much higher than what a projector can do. Um, so we have a lot more control to make things pop, uh, a little bit less control, uh, less worry, worse, worrisome about the lighting, um, but you can see movies in this. And I did go to a theater to check it out um, and run some tests on it, which did include me contacting the product manager. And, and by the way, this was in, uh, in Houston that I did this okay. at, uh, at the theater with the Onyx screen there. And I called the product manager and he's like, uh, yeah, uh, it's just like any other Samsung TV we make. It's just a lot, a lot bigger. He said like every other TV, like HDMI inputs and stuff. He said, yeah. I said, where's the HDMI input? So yeah. once you told me where that was in the top secret location, unless you're in the movie industry, you might know where it is. Um, we brought an Xbox and we played Forza. 
on a 560 odd inch screen, like so in oh, the movie theater. My God! Um, so it was uh, it was incredible. Uh, yeah. the frame rate was there to handle Xbox. The colors popped. Uh, it was tr it was it was just it was super real. And then playing in a in a movie theater with surround sound. But the point is is that the technology is not just being used for home theaters coming soon, uh, or you know for the 146 inch and above. But it's already being used in movie theaters and higher end movie theaters looking to offer something more. Uh, they're using the Samsung LED. Now, what I want to say is that these Samsung LEDs have the ability to be very, very bright. And almost any time you see a Samsung LED in a commercial application, especially if anyone here goes to the trade shows, we run them hot. We run them bright. We want them to pop. We want them to look great. Uh, which is a lot of times what you see in the store. But when you go to the movie theater, you actually see one of these Samsung LEDs calibrated, uh, calibrated to perfect uh, color and <laughs> contrast. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do that with an LED, you're, you're really only using a very small portion of its performance curve, uh, meaning the brightness on this panel is turned way down because a the movie theater has complete control of light, so yep. you don't need to go as bright. Um, so for anyone who wants to see this technology completely calibrated by the experts, Go check out our Onyx screen and you can see what LED looks like when it's calibrated to look like a projector and really get to check out uh, the, the the abilities of, of Samsung LED. Yeah, uh, this is a good question that just came in here from Alan. Uh, lifespans of these new TVs, that's something that everybody asks me. How long should how long should this TV last? That's a that's a great question, and it really it really accounts for usage. Um, the uh, TVs have backlights. I don't have the hours of how many backlights, uh, how many hours the backlights do last for. Um, so I really can't put a number on it. Uh, but years and years of enjoyment uh, from a current TV. There's no newer technology in here that's going to fade or degrade over time. It's just the backlighting system. I have Samsung LED TVs in my house that are that are over 10 years old and working just fine. Okay. Here's another good question that came in. Does Samsung offer high refresh rate TVs geared towards gaming? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, yes, we do. Uh, all of the Samsung QLEDs that have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, enhanced game mode or mm -hmm. real game enhancer will support variable refresh rates and move up into those refresh rates uh, depending on the needs or push of the game. Got it. So, well, like, I'm but just so, just make sure we're all clear. Yeah. Uh, Xbox on certain games does make you choose between um, high frame rate uh, or uh, resolution. So on older sets, depending on the bandwidth, you can't do both. So you have to pick one or the other. But mm -hmm. on the newer TVs, you will be able to do uh, the variable refresh rate. Got it. And that came out. That came out a little while ago. That's something you've been doing for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a FreeSync and G-Sync. Uh, right now we do support FreeSync, which is what the consoles are using. G-Sync is what the uh, computers are using. And uh, I do believe we'll be getting a G-Sync upgrade very soon. Oh, cool. Uh, OK, it's a good time to go through some questions here as we're getting them coming. <laughs> well, here's a question that we do get. Well, Samsung AK upscale my old Grateful Dead VHS tapes I still enjoy watching. Absolutely. That's the great thing about um, Samsung 8K is that we do have a scaler that will upconvert anything, including uh, your Grateful Dead VHS tapes. Um, and so it really doesn't matter what you watch. We have an upscaler. But what makes Samsung different is we are using artificial intelligence for the last few years now in our upscaling. And this AI really allows us to figure out, um, you know, if... Uh, the resolution of what you're watching, what's up on the screen, and then relies on database and all this information that's being crunched by our supercomputer, the quantum processor, uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that whether you're watching 4K, 8K, or The Grateful Dead uh, in, in 480p, that you will be able to watch it in 8K. You'll be able to enjoy your Scarlet Begonias and Fire on the Mountain just as much as I do. Hmm. Let's see... Is there going to be a CES show this year? <laughs> oh, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, let me tell you. Uh, I'm in the 15 CESs with Samsung. It is my favorite week of the year. Um, you know, this is where Samsung gets to showcase uh, what's coming the next year. It's what Samsung has been using to showcase lots of future technologies like robotics and, and just really mind-blowing 
things. I mean, the most mind blowing thing at this past CES was this little ball. It looked like um, like a softball, like the size yeah, of a yeah. softball called Bali and, and or Bali, and it rolls around your house as a camera on it, and it's your digital assistant. So that like, for example, if I had one here and like while watering the plants was on my checklist, like my daily checklist, Bally would recognize that my action of watering the plants, check it off. And if I spilled some dirt, it would call my Samsung robot vacuum to clean up after me. So CES is where we see mind blowing things. We, we did launch, you know, talking about last CES, we had the Q900 and the Q950, uh, which are out in retail now. These are 8K TVs with a zero bezel. And you know, some people are like, so what's hot about 8K? Well, obviously the resolution, obviously the content coming, obviously the video gaming, but for Samsung, uh, our 8K TVs have an invisible bezel. I mean, it's it's 99 to 1% screen bezel uh, ratio. The object tracking sound puts speakers on, on the sides, the top, the bottom, speakers all the way around for this object tracking sound. So it's gonna have not just our best resolution, best picture, it's also gonna have our best sound, our best design. Um, but will there be a CES this year? I sure do hope so. But Bruce, it's one of the times I can honestly say being in the industry or out of the industry, I know no more or less than you. I sure hope so though. Yeah. Um, and I think there was one up here that I wanted to grab. I'm scrolling through the comments right here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. You know, while, while you're scrolling through, yep. um, you know, it might be a nice time to talk about Sarah. Um, whether you're aware of it or not, S-E-R-O is another lifestyle product coming from Samsung. That is vertical. So it's this way. And then it rotates to this way when needed on a motorized rotation. Right. From this way to this way. Now, why is it important? Well, when it is this way, the TV takes up a lot less room. We do have something similar to the ambient mode he showed where you can put up movie posters, uh, clocks, and various things to hide it. And what we're finding is, is that there's a lot of content in vertical. So Samsung launched this vertical TV that rotates. Uh, in Korea last year. At CES, we saw no less than five other manufacturers uh, replicating this design where you have a vertical TV mm -hmm. that rotates either with the push of the button. For Samsung, when I am watching screen mirroring from my phone to the TV, if I'm holding my phone vertical, the TV's vertical, but when I switch it to this, the TV automatically switches. If using an Apple product, you have to push a button, uh, but it doesn't happen automatically like with a Samsung, but between TikTok, Instagram, social media and the way people use TVs these days, um, they want to take advantage of the most amount of resolution as possible. And watching something vertically on a horizontal TV, it takes up a small slither. You don't get that full resolution mm -hmm. as turning it. So, you know, this could be another big part of the future of TV, which is TVs that do rotate to meet the ever so changing needs of our customer base. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've seen some videos of that. It's really cool how that works. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a question from Stanley. He says, does Samsung upgrade apps on older TVs since there seems to be fewer apps now from when I purchased my TV? You know, there's generally one thing that will dictate whether we want to upgrade an app on an older TV. Does the hardware support it? Each right. year we have to bump up the hardware to handle more taxing apps and things that are coming on our TV. Uh, so if the TV can't, then we unfortunately can't as well. And to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that may change, uh, some streaming sites may require that the trailer of the movie you're looking at rolls in the background. I'm sure some of you have seen this, you're looking at the tile and all of a sudden things are rolling in the background. If you don't have the memory to do that, um, you can't upgrade the app. So unfortunately, hardware is the limiting fact, but where we can, we do. Got it, got it. So I just wanna show everybody here. Um, give me one second to do that. I wanna get something up on the screen. We have on our website, um, the 2020 TVs available. Whoops, I'm doing too many things at one time. Gotta move this down first. There we go, okay. Um, and if you go to our website, we can showcase just those 2020 TVs. So let me hit share here. So when you go to shop all TVs from us on this left-hand side here, uh, you should also be able to see my screen, right? Yeah, you can see it. Okay. 
you can scroll down here and then we have model year 2020. All right, so this will put a filter on all the TVs to show you all the current 2020 TVs. Hey, that just popped up. Very nice. TV talk with Samsung. Join us live. Um, so we have that separated for you. And Scott mentioned earlier, too, about uh, how easy it is to set up your TV. But you also know that we're all here for you virtually with Worldwide Surrey. If you have a question about your new TV that you purchased from us, you can please reach out to us so we can help you. Uh, we can video chat or whatever to try and help you with your setup of your TV to optimize it to make sure that it's working as you want it to. So don't forget about that. Well, we certainly covered a lot today and talked about a lot of different things. Scott, thank you so much for being with us and, again, taking the time. I know you're a busy man, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, again, anybody watching this, if you have any further questions, please keep them coming. We will get to them. Um, this will be on Facebook and also YouTube if you want to reference anything. Um, also, tomorrow we have our Hi-Fi Happy Hour, which is at 5 o'clock, uh, again, on Facebook and YouTube. And we'll be talking more things, all TVs talking about picture settings and voice control, streaming services. So we're going to talk a lot more about TVs tomorrow as well um, on our Hi-Fi Happy Hour, which will be at 5 o'clock tomorrow, Facebook and YouTube. So, Scott, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great time here today. Yep, thanks uh, for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very welcome. All right, guys. I will see you tomorrow on the Hi-Fi Happy Hour at 5 o'clock and then also next week. Don't forget to join us for our next Lunch and Learn at noon time Wednesday. All right. This is Adam from Worldwide Stereo reminding you to listen to music every day. So long, folks.